This is David Hofmeister's Unwind Your Mind Back to God Read by Tarana Singh In today's episode we continue unlearning the world with book 2. In chapter 2, this is the third and final section of section 5. Concern for the Body, Part 3 David In the beginning, the mind is just starting to be aware of these ego defense mechanisms. Like noticing your dad's seeming desire to be right, or your mom's seeming controlling tendencies, etc. For years, these defense mechanisms have been kept out of awareness. When you start working with the Course, everything starts getting raised up. All these devious schemes and maneuvers and games come right up into awareness. But the mind is still invested in the ego. So it sees the defenses in others. When you feel angry or frustrated at a brother for using a particular defense, being controlling or whatever it is. You are failing to forgive yourself for the very same attempt. You still believe that the defense has a reality. You are seeing it out there. But when you start to pull it back to your mind, you start to see the control in yourself. The guilt from transferring it from one seeming person or body to another seeming person or body is enormous. Instead of blaming your brother, the blame gets turned onto your own seeming body. But it is still the same error. We have to see that I am mind. This identity that I took off of my brother but still saw in myself is also just a construct in my mind. Otherwise, what good is the transfer? I am not so much angry and blaming my father or my mother anymore, but I walk around angry, blaming who I believe to be me. The error is transferred, but not released yet. It is only a step. Friend, so do not leave it with my body. What is the next step? David, the next step is to get more in touch with the idea that I am mind. I am not a body on the screen in the world. I am not a linear construct. You have to begin to let go of the ways you have always conceived of yourself. As a person with a past, with aspects that you are not so happy about, with a closet full of grievances, with preferences for some people and situations, with the wish for things to be different than they are, etc. You also have to let go of the ways you have conceived of yourself being in the future. Whether it is regarding a career or whether it is in the spiritual context of moving toward the atonement. That puts salvation in the future. 
instead of a career in the world, now it is salvation. Even that you have to question. What good is future salvation? What good is future happiness? It seemed to be a helpful stepping stone to a point until you start reading the immediacy of salvation. Be not content with future happiness. Be not content with future happiness. Text chapter 26, section 8 Do not project the atonement into the future. You have to bring it back to the present. In order to bring it back to the present, we have to let go the way we have conceived of ourselves and of everyone else we meet. If I conceive of persons as these linear constructs with real pasts and real futures and of myself as a linear construct with a real past and a real future, then how can I avoid aiming the guilt I pull away from others towards this linear construct of myself? The shift is to see that mind is not in a linear construct. The right mind is in the present. The right mind does not have a past and it does not have a future. It is like a pinnacle on top of a mountain. If you can get to the top, the view is spectacular. Spectacular. You can look at all the little roads below and all the little lines that you seem to take and the others seem to be taking. From that point, it can all just be seen as one false thing. That is how it has gone for me. It always comes back to me. I am a point, not a line. That is a simple way to remember that you are not guilty. Whenever you feel guilty about what is coming up or worried about loose ends or a bad relationship, just come back to the thought that I am a point and not a line. Friend, I am realizing that I have been trying to bring truth to the illusion instead of illusion to the truth. Now I am just seeing my oneness with God and how everything pales beside that. David What but the body has such frailty that constant care and watchful deep concern are needful to protect its little life. What but the body falters and must fail to serve the Son of God as worthy host. Yet it is not the body that can fear, nor be a thing of fear. It has no needs but those which you assign to it. It needs no complicated health structures of defense, no health-inducing medicine, no care, and no concern at all. Workbook Lesson 135, Para 4 and 5 Now that is obviously a hugely different view than the importance the world gives to the body. 
It is helpful to think of the body as a marionette or a puppet. Sometimes I like to think of it as a learning device, even like a pen or a pencil. I have to, in my mind, equate it with something that can be a symbol of how insignificant it is. I mean, normally, you would not consider putting all this care and concern and careful watching over a pencil. You use a pencil for what a pencil is for, writing, and then you lay it down. You keep sharpening it as long as you need it. And then, when it gets too short, so that you cannot hold it anymore, it is gone. You lay it aside. In that sense, thinking of the body as being like a pencil is a helpful metaphor. Defend its life or give it, give it gifts to make it beautiful or walls to make it safe and you but say your home is open to the thief of time, corruptible and crumbling, so unsafe it must be guarded with your very life. Workbook Lesson 135, Para 5 You could defend its life through security systems, carrying mace or medical interventions. Give it gifts to make it beautiful, can be adorning the body, giving it compliments, is really making it out to be more than it really is. Friend, Mom gave me this bracelet for my graduation and my response was not the response she was looking for. She said, Don't you like it? And I said, I really do. It is a wonderful symbol of you. Thank you. She said, What do you mean a symbol? I tried to explain it to her. I said, For me, I can look at it as a symbol but I do not want to see it as something adorning because that kind of takes away from its purpose. David That was the best use of the bracelet because it was a starting point for you to just share. It opened up a conversation to go into something and in that sense it is neither good nor bad. The Holy Spirit can make use of everything, including bracelets on arms. Is not this picture fearful? Can you be at peace with such a concept of your home? Yet what endowed the body with the right to serve you thus, except your own belief? It is your mind which gave the body all the functions that you see in it and set its value far beyond a little pile of dust and water. Who would make defense of something that he recognized as this? Workbook Lesson 135, Para 6 All this fuss over a pile of dust and water? Who would defend this? But the key is to hear this. What endowed the body with the right to serve you, thus, is your own belief. It is your mind. We do not have to blame the body or the bodies of others if they seem to be acting out if they seem to be using these defense mechanisms or if they seem to be just heaping in the wealth and the possessions. None of that matters. It is my mind. 
What value have I assigned to the body and the world? The only place that you have power to change is within your own beliefs. Whenever you try to change the bodies, so to speak, or the situation, say with something like abortion, then you have already decided that there is a real threat. Once you make the illusions real, you have to come up with the right way of dealing with whatever is perceived out there. The body is in need of no defense. This cannot be too often emphasized. Workbook Lesson 135, Sec- Paris 7 When Jesus says that, he means it very literally. It will be strong and healthy if the mind does not abuse it by assigning it to roles it cannot fulfill, to purposes beyond its scope, and to exalted aims which it cannot accomplish. Such attempts, ridiculous yet deeply cherished, are the sources for the many mad attacks you make upon it. For it seems to fail your hopes, your needs, your values and your dreams. Workbook, Lesson 135, Para 7 If you believe it is your home, then of course it would make sense that you would have a lot of hopes for it, a lot of needs and values for it. You can see how the body would be thought of as more than a pile of dust if you see it as your home. Identity is the most powerful thing there is. Whatever the mind identifies with, it will defend. If it is identified with the spirit, then there is nothing to defend because spirit is invulnerable. It is in a state of grace. If you identify another body as a close friend, then you might feel a need to defend their body. And that defensiveness will go beyond the body to other symbols of your identity, such as your car or your house or job. Friend, my kids... David, yes, your kids. Those are just extensions of this body-self concept. The self that needs protection is not real. The body, valueless and hardly worth the least defense, need merely be perceived as quite apart from you, and it becomes a healthy, serviceable instrument through which the mind can operate until its usefulness is over. Who would want to keep it when its usefulness is done? Workbook Lesson 135, Para 8 The experiential shift of coming to perceive the body as quite apart from you, is something that comes gradually. More like a trickle into a stream than a river. When I first started studying the Course, I was just trying to grasp some of the ideas. Light bulbs were going off but I was not being used as a teacher of God yet. I was not in the river. But the trickle is a start 
and I am grateful for the trickle. It is what I had always wanted. Then when you really start holding on to this as your only purpose and you make the commitment to be used as a teacher of God, every single situation is used for that. Other roles start to recede because you have your commitment and purpose out in front. There is a shift from the trickle to a flow. For me, the experience was like, Wow! It seems like it is all really orchestrated. We have all had glimmers of that. As the commitment grows, you are carried along on a stream and it starts to seem like a pretty quick stream. Before you know it, you find yourself in the river. By the time you are in the river, The body is perceived as quite apart from you. That is when all the plans, cares and concerns for it have so receded from the mind that the mind is just riveted on purpose. There is so much joy and flow. That experiential shift of not thinking of myself as a body has happened for me. When you start to be really centered in the moment, all the things that seem to be happening, whether it is temperature extremes or sharp things flying, It all fades, just fades into the background. The body is not the focal point. It is more like a pencil that you are using. End of section 5